Hello? Ian. Hey, man. Yes. Gotta do this uh, Taylor Pearson episode. You up for quick recording? I'm on baby duty, dog. <laughs> You're on baby duty? What's that mean? You can't hear him? We're, uh, I'd say we're at stage two of, uh, of a meltdown. What? Yeah, I'd say five is a uh, complete meltdown. We're, we're ramping up right now. So if I don't get some food in this baby soon, <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to be full blown. And you're all alone? I'm all alone. <laughs> okay. Me, the cat, and the baby. Can you hear him? <laughs> this is one of the advantages of uh, running a lifestyle business. We'll give you the night off. What do you say? Okay. Talk to you tomorrow morning. <laughs> all right. Ciao. Bye. Hey, podcast listener. Even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Can't shake a stick at the internet without running into an article about cryptocurrency and something I'm trying to wrap my head around a few weeks ago. We had Greg Gerber on the show. He promised that he'd create a blog post resource to teach us, those of us that haven't invested in our first coins yet, how to do that. That one's going to be published at this episode, tropicalmba.com slash cryptocurrency. And we're getting a lot of interest. A lot of people are talking about this. And today I decided to call up friend of the show, Taylor Pearson, who recently wrote an article that got shared widely via Hacker News. And that article is called, Why is Bitcoin Valuable? We're going to talk about the philosophical side of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, where we're at in the movement right now and how we can take advantage of it, and also some practical steps on how we can get involved. So, you know, Taylor is not only a Bitcoin investor, but one of my favorite philosophers when it comes to all things lifestyle businesses. I, as always, had an excellent time talking with Taylor. So I'm just going to play that conversation for you guys right now. Take it away, Mr. Taylor Pearson. So I think one of the interesting things about Bitcoin and sort of like this whole crypto technology thing broadly is that it's just like legitimately very hard to understand to even like sort of start to wrap my head around it. So it took me like years to sort of even begin to understand it. And so I think one of the points that really stood out for me that sort of clicked is a lot of times people will compare Bitcoin. Oh, it's like PayPal, but it's like way worse, right? Because the transaction fees are higher and it's slower you compare it to these sort of pre-existing services and it doesn't make sense. And so I think the one dimension where Bitcoin and cryptocurrency more broadly is actually better than what exists now is what I would call censorship resistance or what a lot of people call censorship resistance, which is the difference between Bitcoin and PayPal is that there is no entity that can stop the transaction from going through. You open your piece by saying... On almost every dimension, Bitcoin, and I think you're also implying a lot of other cryptocurrencies, is worse than its centralized counterparts like Chase Bank or PayPal. Yeah, exactly. There's a bit of a Twitter kerfuffle around one of the early people that was involved in the space made a large donation to WikiLeaks with some of his cryptocurrency in the last few months. And so a lot of people you know, were very angry about, you know, how could you do that? How could you donate to that organization? Some people were strongly opposed and some people were strongly in favor. And his sort of broader point was like, you know, it's my choice to be able to do this and I should be able to do that without someone coming in and censoring me. And that's the opportunity that this allows. How is that useful to people? I mean, I get from a philosophical point of view, how does that matter for business people? You think about the internet and consider there's like sort of like an internet one layer, let's call it like internet one, which was like, the open protocol layer of the internet, this was funded by the Department of Defense and it came out in sort of the 70s, 80s. And it was, you know, SNTP, which is sort of the protocol where you send email. That's like what Gmail uses this open source protocol called SNTP. There's TCP IP and there's HTTP. And so we don't really think about these, but these are sort of the foundational building blocks of the internet. And so that was sort of a lot of what happened in the 90s was building on top of this open protocol layer. And what's happened in the last 
two decades, the last 15 years, is that the second layer called Internet 2 that is a closed ecosystem, right? It's Facebook, it's Amazon, it's Google, it's Apple, it's Netflix, it's all these companies you hear about. And so sort of the irony of the situation is the reason Google got started or the reason Facebook got started and these people built these projects in their dorm rooms or garages or whatever is because they were building on top of this open protocol, they knew there was no way that someone could shut them down, right? There's platform risk for people who run their business on Amazon, but there was no platform risk for Amazon when it got started. Like the HTTP or TCP IP, these were open source projects, were never going to come in and shut down Amazon. And so we have this ecosystem now where a lot of innovation, a lot of new businesses are either closed off or they're at risk because they have this platform risk. There's a centralized entity. You know, if you are an Amazon seller and you sell your products on Amazon, one of the major risks you're mitigating against is I need to make sure that if Amazon, you know, turns my account off and either I have business insurance or something, but like really to prevent me from going bankrupt. So I think like the broader, the exciting idea about this whole censorship resistance notion is that we could sort of reconstruct this layer two. You know, you imagine Amazon where there isn't platform risk, where you don't have the chance that there's, you know, an office in Seattle where they, you know, some algorithm comes along and decides your product is in violation of some terms of service thing, which, you know, they read differently than you do, and your account gets shut down. Right now, what we're hearing about the implications of cryptocurrency is happening to people's bank accounts. It's basically the implications for small business owners has basically been speculators are getting wealthy or broke based on investments. But not a lot of small businesses are seem to really be using this technology yet. But you see that changing in the next what kind of time frame? Yes, I think that is an important distinction to make, right? Like the news about it right now is basically a bunch of hucksters have come in and like found ways to make millions of dollars off doing scammy initial coin offerings or ICOs or those sorts of projects. But I do think, I mean, I guess I kind of come back to the internet timeline, like, you know, maybe we're in the mid nineties internet years and sort of the, if you call it like the lifestyle business or this being able with the second layer of being able to build on top was maybe 10 years after that, like mid two thousands was kind of when that could happen. And then by, you know, 2010, it was starting to flourish. So 10 ish years. Let's talk about what was hard to learn. Because you said you first heard about this stuff four or five years ago, and then you really invested yourself into it. Like, why was it so hard? So I think part of it is the difference between the technology and like what the current conversation around it was. So like when I first heard about it, the current conversation around it was all these people that were super libertarian, super anti-government, everything the government does is evil, and this is the way we can sort of like strike back at them. And then that transitioned basically to like the drug money thing, where this is like a way you can buy stuff on Silk Road and buy illegal drugs. And neither of those narratives were very compelling. So I think part of the challenge is seeing, you know, the difference between where the technology is now versus this idea that in 10 to 15 years, we could have this, you know, entire open source layer of protocols that allow all these sorts of new business ideas to take off and to flourish. I think that's part of it. And the other part is just really the, what I would call like the technology. So the sort of, if you read the original Bitcoin white paper, which I think is very much worth reading, it's nine pages long. I probably read it half a dozen times and I still don't really get it <laughs> because there's, you know, some at least intermediate level of cryptography knowledge, like how to, what is a hashing algorithm and how do hashing algorithms work and why are they difficult to break and what does all that mean? There's some intermediate level knowledge of like game theory or economics, right? You have this, the way Satoshi Nakamoto, the anonymous founder, or anonymous creator of Bitcoin structured the system is that you have a group of miners, a group of users, and a group of developers. And the, the mechanics of the system sort of create this game theory dynamic where all of them are sort of interacting with each other that's supposed to make the system stable or anti-fragile, right? And so I think, yeah, there's just is... It is a bit technical. And I think, I think the same thing is going to happen with the internet, right? Like all that stuff sort of gets abstracted away at some point. It's like I couldn't explain to you how the TCP IP protocol works, but it doesn't actually matter. So I think over time, that stuff will sort of get abstracted away a little bit. But at this point, understanding the ecosystem does involve understanding those elements. In our notes here, you wrote that you quoted, Bitcoin is like having a Swiss bank account 
in your pocket. Where did you get that? And what does it mean? So that line is actually from Barack Obama. He made that remark South by Southwest, I believe it was 2015, plus or minus a year. The question we now have to ask is if technologically it is possible to make an impenetrable device or system where the encryption is so strong that there's no key, there's no door at all, then how do we apprehend the child pornographer? How do we solve or disrupt a terrorist plot? What mechanisms do we have available to even do simple things like tax enforcement? Because if, in fact, you can't crack that at all, government can't get in, then everybody's walking around with a Swiss bank account in their pocket. And what he's referring to is, you know, effectively democratizing the Swiss bank account, that in the same way the Internet sort of democratized distribution or democratized media, you would say all of a sudden, you know, anyone could set up, you know, a newspaper. It was just called a blog. Cryptocurrency, I think, is trending towards making that possible with banking, right? That anyone can have access to this very, you're called censorship resistant banking. You know, Swiss banks and Bitcoin have a lot in common in that way. Bitcoin is not as anonymous as people thought it was early on, or at least it's been repeated to be. It's more trackable, but there are alternatives that are coming up that are really fully anonymous and basically impossible to track. Today's show is sponsored by Empire Flippers. They're the leading specialist in helping entrepreneurs buy, sell, and invest in online businesses. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Empire Flippers integrated, dedicated teams make sure that you're supported at every stage in the process. And they have a huge audience and great contacts in the industry. So for sellers, you're going to secure a higher price than if you were to sell privately. And if you're a buyer, they're going to save you a ton of time and money by carefully vetting all the businesses on their marketplace. So whether you're looking to buy or sell anything from $20,000 up to seven figures, check out empireflippers.com slash TMBA. And if you go there, you can save yourself 300 bucks. That's because today for TMBA listeners, the Empire Flippers have offered a free business valuation, which normally costs $300. So if you're looking to acquire a business, new offerings are posted every Monday morning. So that's empireflippers.com slash TMBA. MBA. And a huge thanks to the team over at Empire Flippers for supporting the TMBA podcast. All this sounds nice, especially for people making millions of dollars off of speculating on this stuff. Most of the people listening to this show, they're not speculators. They want to know, what's this all going to mean for me? Like, How could I position my business to take advantage of these trends? Which as we've known and we've seen over the years, it's a whole different kind of speculation and a potentially very profitable one. Like people in our community who saw Amazon coming along, they made a lot of money, you know, whether it's selling shovels to the people selling there or whether they were actually in the trenches building companies on Amazon. And maybe we could talk about some of the opportunities that you see coming down the pike for small business owners. Yeah. So I think one interesting one is like the idea of the end of platform risk or dramatic decrease in platform risk that for most of these call them micro multinational businesses or these small independent businesses, the biggest, you know, existential risk factor is platform risk. It's that, you know, you get 50% of your leads from Facebook ads and Facebook decides they don't like your ad account anymore and that disappears overnight. Or so, you know, the same story with Amazon, the same story with Google. If that plays out, and I think it will, will be uh, a really big deal. I think also with all these platforms, right, there's going to be, you know, you imagine there's a new Uber or a new Facebook or a new Amazon or whatever, there is a really big opportunity for the early adopters on those platforms. You, know, you mentioned Amazon, right? The people that got on Amazon five years ago and were one of the first you know, early group of third-party sellers and became very good at that were basically able to build you know, sort of a competitive advantage in terms of their IP about how the space works and how you rank a product on Amazon and how do you choose products that are good fits for Amazon, et cetera. So I think that's an interesting opportunity. There is going to be this sort of like blue ocean era of these new protocols and what can be done with them. And I, I think, yeah, you know, that probably is five or 10 years away. I think another interesting trend you know, that you've talked about on the podcast a lot is this idea of like micro multinationals or companies that are based in multiple jurisdictions. 
I think that's going to get easier. I've talked to a few people in the cryptocurrency space that because they really don't have any legal ties to the U.S., you know, their business operates on top of a open source protocol that's not you know legally housed in the U.S. They really don't have to be in the United States necessarily. And again, I think that is also quite a few years away. A couple of the other interesting things, I think there's going to be like lifestyle businesses for financial services. There's a lot of like industries that sort of the micro multinational lifestyle business trend hasn't touched. But I can imagine like uh, if you think about granting a mortgage contract or banks, you know, offer mortgages, they have like one particular risk model that they're using for everyone, which is like very inefficient in a lot of ways. But you could imagine having a sort of, if you could write a mortgage contract for authors and you're going to use, you know, specific metrics related because you understand that industry better, right? Like, you know, how many books did they sell last year and how large is their email list and, you know, how many followers do they have on Twitter? And, you know, you could you know, figure out four or five metrics and you could build a custom risk profile. I see. So you could imagine how money could, all of a sudden, the velocity of money could be radically increased. Yes. You know, one of the things that is very difficult for me, you, you mentioned mortgages, is to get a mortgage itself because I don't like use credit cards in the United States. So if like I go to a bank, I could show them my bank account and they wouldn't give me a mortgage even though I could cover it because I don't fit into their model essentially. Like I don't have a job that like for the last five years that's guaranteed payment or whatever. And so they won't give me a mortgage. And so I'm kind of in the position right now that if I wanted a mortgage, I'd have to go to private investors, which is like really a pain in the ass basically. So it would be so fascinating to go to a lender of cryptocurrencies and say, Hey, like my customers pay me in crypto. This is very legible to you here's my track record of getting paid in crypto. So how about you loan me X amount of crypto or whatever? Right. And you could build a custom risk profile. Is there anything that's happening now, Taylor, or like on the immediate horizon? Because in some ways your message is a little comforting because you're basically saying, you know, this is still so early days that there isn't this like legible application layer and that people, the use cases are pretty limited. You know, it's like, it's pretty early days in other words. Yeah, that's at least at this point, that's very much my feel. I think like the use case that's mature, if you want to call it that, and it's not even that mature really, but is people that are using Bitcoin or other what you would call like store of value cryptocurrencies as sort of like a digital gold, right? That there are people that, you know, 10 years ago, they would have like, you know, held 5% of their portfolio in gold. And now, you know, that maybe they hold two and a half percent in gold and two and a half percent in Bitcoin or something, right? And it's like gold and that, you know, it's hard. It's censorship resistant. Gold is also censorship resistant. You know, it's got some other nice properties compared to gold. You know, it's easier to send. It's easier, you know, to divide up fractionally. It's easier to carry around. Mr. Money Mustache recently wrote that investing in Bitcoin is stupid. What do you think of that perspective? There is a lot of this arguing on the internet about whether this is all a bunch of yahoos and scam artists, and there's really nothing at the core of this. It depends how you define investing. I think there are a few ways to look at it. I think like one way to look at it that I think makes a lot of sense is buying $50 worth of Bitcoin is like buying a modem or something in 1993, and you're just like learning how the technology works and tinkering around with it because it's probably going to be important someday you know, it'd be interesting to see how it works. So that's not like investing for financial gain. It's investing from like an educational perspective, right? I mean, I'm going to buy whatever the top three cryptocurrencies are and I'm going to buy $20 of each and I'm going to follow, you know, I'm going to just read the news about them a little bit and just see how they're developing because now, you know, I can see the price go up and down in my wallet or whatever. Maybe I'll buy a little hardware wallet or I'll buy something else and I'll send them around and, you know, you see how you send them around. So I think that, if you want to call that investing, that makes a lot of sense. I think sort of like the next step above that, you do a 1% or 2% of your net worth allocation. And that's, I would call that sort of, that's almost like the Taleb model. Nassim Taleb is an author who made his career and has written about sort of unlikely events. And so he invested by betting on events that were very unlikely, but if they happened, would have a very large magnitude. So everyone that's investing in the cryptocurrency ecosystem right now is doing so for that reason, right? You know, we've talked about there's not a lot of use cases that are actually happening, but they're saying, well, 
whatever this one cryptocurrency I'm buying is probably going to go to zero. That's the most likely thing that's going to happen. But if I'm buying Filecoin, which is a competitor to Amazon Web Services, and this thing ends up being three times as big as Amazon Web Services, it's going to be a really huge deal. So sort of that like, you know, venture capitalist or option trader mindset. To me, this is investing 101. The fact that Bitcoin is volatile is the problem with it. And to me, that's the opportunity, right? And that's why you don't take these investment strategies where you take 70% of your net wealth and you trust a third party like the US stock exchange or whatever and say, hey, here's my money. I trust that you're going to grow. Instead, you say, I don't trust anybody. <laughs> I'm going to take a small percentage of what I own and I'm going to put it in a volatile asset and hope that it goes crazy. You know, that seems to make a lot of sense to me. That's not even speculation. That's the thing. Like, speculation is going to a craps table or putting a huge percentage of your net worth on this idea because someone whispered in your ear at a Mason's meetup two weeks ago that you heard something from so-and-so banker that something's going to happen. That's speculation. But to me, taking a small percentage of your net worth and distributing across highly volatile assets is just smart. Going back to Nassim Taleb, like his, he called it the barbell strategy, right? That he put 80% of his assets in something that was very, very safe, like treasury bills or US dollars, it was just sitting in cash, and some 20% of it in something that was very, very risky. So, you know, you maybe put 1% in Bitcoin and you put 1% on, you know, some Pandora going to zero or, you know, some of these events that are very unlikely, but if they happened, would be very impactful. Taylor, I hope that you can become like our Bitcoin correspondent. <laughs> Taylor, what are the best books to read about Bitcoin that exist? If you were just one to get started, the book I'd actually do is The Internet of Money by Andreas Antonopoulos. The book is just a collection of his it's edited transcripts of his YouTube talks. So if you prefer YouTube, you can just watch the talks on YouTube. But it's mostly just focused on the why. It doesn't really dive into the technicals. Just kind of like, why is this important? And it's like pretty breezy. It's like a two or three hour read at most. You can like sit down on a Saturday afternoon and knock it out. After that, one book that I'm actually rereading it right now, and it's kind of very widely talked about in this space, is a book called The Sovereign Individual. It came out in the late 90s. Allegedly, there's a lot of reason to believe that Satoshi Nakabono read the book multiple times before designing Bitcoin because there's a section in the book that describes what they call cyber cash, which more or less you know, perfectly describes Bitcoin and how it works. Uh, and so that's also sort of like a why book. It talks a lot about the implications, you know, what does it mean to be like sort of moving into this? Uh, they call it the information age. The book had a lot of play around the election. Uh, it talks a lot about nationalism and why nationalism is going to be a large force globally going forward. The next book I would say is Digital Gold by Nathaniel Popper, who is a former guest on the podcast I know. It's sort of like a narrative nonfiction, like Michael Lewis, where it's just the story of Bitcoin and how it got started. It's just like a really exciting story. It's like, how did this thing happen where this like random internet guy on some mail list sent out a nine page <laughs> white paper for this thing he built and like now it's worth a half trillion dollars. Very cool. And we'll link up to Nathaniel's episode. We had him on a few months back. Taylor, could you walk us through how to buy Bitcoin? Are you able to do that? Like the dummies version of how to buy any kind of cryptocurrency? Probably the easiest way. If you're in the US... The easiest way to get started is a company called Coinbase. Some of the alternatives, just to put that there, are Kraken, K-R-A-K-E-N, and Gemini. I think those are probably the most three. They call them like fiat on-ramps, but ways to kind of move from fiat currency to cryptocurrency. Fiat is just U.S. dollars or whatever you have, euros. Yeah, euros, U.S. dollars, Chinese yuan, whatever it is. I guess I'll jump the gun a little bit here. Doesn't using somebody like Coinbase get rid of that original value you talked about at the beginning of the episode that this is doesn't require third parties? The first step is to get a third party involved, it seems here. Yeah, 100%, which is like, yeah, that's one of the very fragile elements of the system, right? That you have this whole system, but sort of the intersection of, quote unquote, the old economy and, quote unquote, the new economy you know, where those two meet is this like very fragile and right. You know, Coinbase is fully regulated. You know, the SEC, they just got subpoenaed actually by the IRS in 2017 to turn over all their books. So, you know, yes, it's very much this like fragile, trusted third party that you need to go through to get involved. 
Coinbase is like there's like these devices in movies like in the matrix when you go from like the real world into the matrix you know like coinbase is the door exactly like the closet that takes you into narnia or whatever like you got to go through this and and actually coinbase is for me probably the most compelling character in nathaniel's book so if you want to understand coinplace's role and its rise to prominence and why it exists and everything digital gold is a good place to to read about that but anyway so what you're saying is that for most people, if you want to get started with Bitcoin, if you don't have a business that charges in Bitcoin, you have to turn some of your fiat currency into cryptocurrency, and you need a third party right now to do that. Yes. There's a site called localbitcoins.com, which is it's just a marketplace. So you can say, you know, I'm in Austin, Texas, and I want to buy half a Bitcoin. And if someone else is in Austin, Texas, you know, you can meet them in a coffee shop and you can exchange the Bitcoin. That's so funny. I already have like this really vivid imaginative idea of who I'm going to talk to at these cafes. <laughs> Sounds like a great way to meet new friends. <laughs> oh, it's an interesting crowd. All right. So you get the third party involved. And what's the next step? So it's basically like setting up a Schwab account or a TD Ameritrade, just like a brokerage account. You sign up, you connect your bank account, you know, your Bank of America account or whatever. And there's a button that says buy Bitcoin and you enter how much you want to buy. You want to buy $50. You click $50, it credits to your account, and then it just ACHs from your bank account. You can also buy it on, I think that you can buy it on credit cards now, which I strongly recommend against. There's no reason to pay interest rates on <laughs> buying your Bitcoin. But yeah, you just connect it to your bank account. You can also wire money in, but the easiest thing to do is you just sync it up with whatever your bank account is and buy 50 bucks or whatever. Are you still with us or is this, is this stuff all a little bit complicated? You know, I'm definitely a newbie, and I'm pretty sure that's coming across, and I'm learning as I go here. Now we're going to take a turn and dive a bit into why people get so fired up about cryptocurrency, both those who are in support of or for some reason critique all of this excitement about this new approach to money. Have you read through some of the responses to your article, Why is Bitcoin Valuable? I have. I've read through all of them, I think. Was there anything that surprised you about the reaction to the piece or confused you or got you fired up a little bit? It was actually a lot more controversial than I expected. And, and what's controversial about it? I think a lot of it is, you know, you did an episode with Greg Gerber talking about cryptocurrency a few weeks or a few months ago. And one of the things Greg's mentioned was money is a very emotional topic. And I think that's a big part of it. You know, money is just emotional period. And whether you're talking about cryptocurrency or you're talking about you know, someone being in debt or taking out a loan of credit or whatever. Money is just emotional. And so anytime you're talking about something people see as money, emotions are going to get involved. That's a big part of it. The other element is some of the comments were sort of like, you know, I was around when the internet was getting started and I remember this sort of uh, everything's going to be different and it's this whole new open thing and look where we are. And I, I think that criticism is actually really true, that things are never as good or as bad as they seem. Like this is not going to be some panacea that, you know, cures all the problems with our modern society. And, you know, in the same way as the internet, like it could be a meaningful improvement on a number of different levels or different parameters. So I think that criticism is really valid. And then I think kind of the other gist of the criticism or the other thing is a lot of people looking at sort of what's happening right now or what the technology is able to do now. And, you know, the fact that the market is volatile and the fact that, you know, a lot of these initial coin offerings that are happening are scammy or uncouth or whatever and saying, well, you know, the technology is never going to mount anything because look at what's going on right now. So, I mean, I think that criticism is valid. Like, is there a bunch of, you know, scammy and hucksters and everything happening right now? For sure. But I don't think that sort of discredits, you know, if you follow the technology to its logical conclusion, you end up at a very different place than we are now. So sort of that rabbit trail is what's interesting to me. Something popped into my head when you said like money's so emotional. And I was like, why? And it's, well, part of it has to do with how much we identify with it. And so I can understand why people are angry and jealous, you know, hardworking people that work to get paid. They're angry when people do things that seem superficial or scammy. But these things have happened throughout history, right? Like there's these waves of the hardworking people looking at the speculators saying somehow like their integrity is compromised because like I identify with like working hard for like real things of real value. 
and this person is somehow departing from that. And I wonder if crypto has a potential to be healthier for us because so many of us, we sort of work our whole lives for money. And it's this one kind of thing that like everybody has to kind of figure out their attunement towards it. But maybe with new kinds of currency, you could have a currency, much like lifestyle businesses, sort of morph themselves around what their founders want to do as opposed to like being an organizational person. You could imagine a, a currency doing something similar. Like this is the way I value value and I'll interact with people that value it that way. Like blockchain or cryptocurrency is a metaphor, like the metaphorical significance might actually be bigger than the technological significance, like a lot of for that same reason, right? That markets in general are a very powerful metaphor. Like one of the ideas behind lifestyle businesses, one of these notions is that, you know, you have how much money you make, but you also have where you're able to live and, you know, who you're able to spend your time with and all these other, you know, quote unquote currencies that you can often you can find these arbitrages, right? It's like, you know, I can move to Asia and I can make half as much money, but I can lead, you know, an even better lifestyle and I can reinvest that money into building a business, which is going to give me more opportunities down the road. And so I think just the idea of, you know, when you start to look at markets more often, you start to think about, you know, currencies trading against one another and, you know, valuations going up and down based upon market conditions, like that metaphorical construct is really valuable. And can be applied, you know, even without getting cryptocurrency involved. So fascinating. More on that, I hope, in the future. Your example of like the mortgage for authors is to me really illuminating. You could actually imagine something like that existing. Yeah. Also like financial services. But you know, if you let's say you run an e-commerce business now and you know you have cash flow problems and you want to go get a line of credit from the bank so that you're able to, you know, purchase inventory. Impossible. Right, exactly. So one of the other interesting use cases is you'll have these organizations, basically these custodial organizations, which will help you effectively put your assets on the blockchain. So you know, say you manufacture valet equipment and you need to buy steel to make this valet equipment. So you got to buy the steel and then you also have to pay the workers. You have to pay the people that are building this thing to you know, shape the steel into whatever the shape of the valet podium is, but it's difficult to pay them because you just wrapped up all your cash into buying this physical thing. So what you could do is you could actually go to someone and you could securitize basically that asset on the blockchain and then borrow against its value. So you have $100,000 worth of steel in your manufacturing plant and you have someone that you pay a very nominal fee to, or you know, when it becomes an efficient system, you pay a very low fee to, and you can borrow from yourself at zero percent interest or you know near zero percent interest because you've removed all the counterparty risk, right? Like the reason the bank won't give you the loan or they give you the loan at this like very high APR at a very high interest rate is because there's a risk that you're not going to pay them back. Whereas if you know that steel is securitized, it's on the blockchain, you know, there's a smart contract associated with that. And if you don't pay it back in time, they just immediately repossess that asset. And so there's actually no counterparty risk. So you can justify much, much lower interest rates. So like going back to what you're saying about like the velocity of money increasing, you know, imagine if all these assets, which are now currently illiquid, could basically become liquid because they're, they're registered on the blockchain. And that's why the author's example is a little bit better because that's an idealized version. I'm imagining even if this application exists, how difficult it would be to get all the parties to like appropriately interact with the blockchain. But you could imagine people that are selling bits are going to be much faster because if you want to write more books next year, you could imagine accepting a loan from somebody that could literally just take your like own your listings on Amazon. Right. Or just take over the royalty stream if you defaulted on the loan. Taylor, are you willing to do a bonus round? Sure. Okay. So... The last time you were on the show was probably one of the top 10 all-time episodes in terms of the depth of its impact. So I'll link to that. I think, based on speaking with the audience, you think about productivity in ways that are useful to other people and that make a difference. In fact, you sell a course that helps people get more done, essentially. I'm curious, what have you learned about productivity since that episode through your own tinkering as well as working with your students? 
I'm not the most productive guy in the world. So I'm right here. I got a, I got a beeline to the source. So what do you see and people struggle with? So I think sort of in our community, one of the major ones is, you know, accountability or, you know, if you're working at home or even you're working in a co-working space, you're working in cafes or something, you know what you need to do and you have maybe even know, I don't want to do this, why you're excited about it, what your sort of like motivation is, but people just don't seem to work very well in a bubble. And I think that does depend on personality types. I work alone most of the time and that works well for me, but that seems to be the exception rather than the rule. So yeah, I don't actually have a great solution to that problem. Obviously, you're the proprietor of a community of people that sort of works to solve that with meetups and stuff. But I'd say that's one of the major ongoing challenges. Finding a community, you know, ideally physically, but if not, you know, at least having like a forum or a group or a mastermind call or something like that. Or a team. Where you're actually interacting with people. Or a team, yeah. Or a buddy. The buddy system works really well. I think that's part of the reason why having a business partner can be such a boon for entrepreneurs. Because like that conversation that I get to have with Ian three or four times a week, you know, it's hard to pay for that. If I paid you for that, I would be all out of Bitcoins, bro. You know what I mean? Like that would be expensive. Yeah. That's an interesting one. I think a lot of people can relate to that. The other one I've been thinking about is the phrase I heard is not too tight, not too loose. And so I think a lot of times people have productivity, they get like you say, oh, I'm not getting stuff done. So you get this like real rigid system in place where you're going to wake up at 8 a.m. every day and you're going to do this from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and you're going to do this from 9 to 9.30 and you're going to do this from 9.30 to 12.30 and you get this whole thing and it goes down. And then, you know, inevitably what happens is, you know, something comes up like some, you know, unexpected life event or whatever and you get thrown off the system and you go, ah, oh, screw it. It's not worth it. You just kind of go back to, to going one way or the other. And so this idea of not too tight, not too loose is having a bit more of an intuitive feel for how things are going. Like, you know, you can feel sometimes like you're just, you're sleeping until 10 and maybe you get started working around one and you're just like not quite getting as much stuff done. And like, maybe you need to just tighten it down a little bit. You know, you just need to get a little bit more rigid, but then also the opposite, right? You know, it's like you got your thing planned out and you got your 14 hours of work that day and, you know, you're drinking soy lint or whatever because you don't want to have the time to work or whatever. Right. You've given up eating. Yeah. And, you know, you're going through these like, you know, feast, famine, crash, hyperproductive cycles and you're dialed in on modafinil and whatever it is. And it's like, maybe you just need to crank it down a little bit and, you know, just a little bit looser. Like, it doesn't have to be that tight. There's a lot of crazy people that we hang around. I won't accuse you of being one of them, but I've seen people that have used drugs to enhance their work that upon reflection, weren't happy with the work that they ended up doing so much of. And so I do think that there's like this intuitive element to it where I like that kind of idea a lot because, you know, fueling yourself up and strapping yourself to your desk and like doing it week after week, that sounds like too tight to me. Yeah. Can I do one more? Actually, I have one more I've been thinking about. Sure. The other thing I've been thinking about that for some people, it does seem to be like a sort of magic bullet. It does depend on the person is some sort of weekly review process. So if you don't have some period of the week, say, you know, an hour at least where you sit down and you just like think about the high level of what's going on in your business and your life, you know, what's going on with your team or strategically what's happening and thinking about that, yeah, on a high strategic level, that's a huge win. And I think one of the big things that does for me and for other people it lets you be more effective during the week because you can sort of like outsource or you can sort of like schedule your freak out and strategic thinking time where, you know, something happens, you're like, what does this mean? Is this going to da 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 You say, all right, you know, whatever, Wednesday or you know, Friday at 2 p.m., I'm going to like sit down and I'm going to like think through this whole thing and if my business is totally hosed <laughs> and everything's going to crap or not. And usually it's like you sit down and you're like, okay, actually, it's not that big of a deal. I need to take ABC action steps over the next month and we can put things back on track. I have a blog post on that. It's in David Allen's Getting Things Done book, like his sort of weekly review process, but having that like one hour blocked off on your calendar where you just sit down and think about things is, I think that's huge. Let's link up to that blog post. I have to share a personal anecdote on that one. One of the things I've been too tight on in the past is journaling because, you know, I love writing. I love when I read a blog post that says journaling is a great thing. And so for a long time, I had myself on the schedule where like I did it for an amount of time and I got burnt out on it because I realized that like so much of my journaling was pointless and I was just doing it to like meet the requirement 
three months ago, I reintroduced journaling into my life, but as a tool and to be used to get things done. And so I use that tool about three mornings a week. And it's whenever it's what you're talking about. Like I need to take a step back and like find some me time and be like, okay, hold up. I'm going to go to the journal and I'm going to sort through this using the journal. And it's also a record that I can go back and refer to. And that's been really good for me to have that back in my life. And it's an example of that like too tight, too loose thing where, you know, the every day, like write for 25 minutes thing. At a certain point, I was like writing the story of yesterday. It was like the most boring story of all time. And it made me think that journaling was pointless, even after having done it for a year. And I realized that there was so much value there, just so long as I focused on that value and not on some arbitrary guideline of how much I needed to do it, you know? So yeah, it comes back to that. Not too tight, not too loose. That's a really fun idea. I think what I'm going to do is run an experiment this week about maybe I'll move all those little journaling sessions into just one. These are my three questions. Is anything nagging me? I'll just like get that out on paper. The second question is what went well in the last week and is there any way to double down on it? So, you know, whatever the blog post went to top on Hacker News, like why is that? You know, that's good. Like is there any way that I can write more blog posts that go to the top story in Hacker News or whatever? And then the other one is what went badly and how can I improve it in the future? So, you know, I didn't go to the gym this week and, you know, why didn't I go to the gym this week and what do I need to do next week so that I can actually fix it? And that sort of, yeah, investigation into my life I find to be super productive. And these things can be personal too. You can talk about your relationships in your life. And you know, one of the things I've been thinking about with myself lately is because I am a, been in a bubble the last few months. I work alone. I work in my own office. I've been thinking a lot about Team Dan, you know, because like as a business owner, your job is to like look out for your customers, for your team, and to help people out. But you need help too. I'm trying to ask myself, who's on Team Dan here? <laughs> I got to look out for myself as well. The weekly review process is a great place to start that line of thinking. You know, like, am I looking out for myself? Am I in a good position to be a good leader to continue being successful with the business and personally as well? It's also time to think about how all those things interact, right? Like, you know, you have a fight with your significant other or with a friend, or yeah, you don't go to the gym for a week. And, you know, it it turns out that's not good for your productivity, right? All these elements sort of interact. And so stepping back and thinking about, how they interact and how you can make them work better together. I'll tell you a personal story about how that works. Like you can get in fights with your significant other because you haven't articulated to yourself what's frustrating you. And it's a really cathartic experience to be able to go to your partner and say, Hey, like the reason I've been grumpy is that I've felt like I've been failing in this area of my life. And I didn't really know that until I wrote it down. And now that I know that here's my plan for trying to address it. Could you support me in that? I'll add one other thing with sort of all those questions. There's this idea of like the Toyota five whys. So it's like from Toyota's lean manufacturing thing that the, the root cause of any problem is always, you know, five whys deep. So like my car broke down. Why'd your car broke down? Because, you know, the battery was dead. Why was the battery dead? Well, because you didn't check the service schedule. Why didn't you check the service schedule? You know, you don't have any calendar reminders to remind you to check things. And so, you know, this root problem, which is like you never set reminders for yourself to fix things and like it ends up breaking. So different things break, you know, but it's all the sort of result of this root cause. You weren't willing to accept responsibility. Why did this thing go bad? I was like, well, because I was like not willing to have this difficult conversation. (laughs) It's not some like hack that I didn't do. It's like I just like avoided this difficult conversation for three months and like it just, you know, it made everything worse. (laughs) Taylor Pearson, thanks for coming on the podcast today. We hope to have you back soon. Always a pleasure. Hey, oh, big thanks to Taylor Pearson, friend of the show. Always uh, look forward to Taylor coming by the pod. He's got an open invite. We are going to post the links, the show notes, to Taylor's books and what he's up to. Also, his article, Why Bitcoin is Valuable. Definitely take a read of that. This one's going to be posted at tropicalmba.com slash cryptocurrency. And as always, we will be back next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you then. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class 
on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.